Welcome to A Chat With Heart. I'm your host, Christina Martin. I'm a singer-songwriter. I live on a dirt road with my best friend, Dale, in rural Nova Scotia, Canada. A Chat With Heart is just me having chill conversations with people I want to celebrate and topics that I'm curious about. If you have a question or a comment for this podcast, call my Heartbeat Hotline, 1902-669-4769. To send this podcast even more love, visit me online at patreon.com backslash Christina Martin. I'm so happy you're listening. Our personal stories have great power to heal, influence, and inspire. All we have to do is show up for the conversation. If we just talk about it, we could shut up. goodness, where do I begin? It's been a while. Yeah. And I've wondered how you're all doing. And, uh, you know, this is season three of A Chat With Heart. This is uh, episode one, season three. And I've, it's been a couple weeks now. I've, I've returned from three months of touring uh, overseas in uh, Central Europe. So we started in Austria and then did a lot of shows in Germany, went over to the Netherlands, and then down to Switzerland, and ended uh, ended the tour with some more Germany shows. There was a total of 36 shows in three months, promoting my new album, Storm, that came out September 1st. And um, it's really hard to describe how, you know, it's like, how's it going? How has it been? Like, it's it's been everything. It's been hard. It's been rewarding. Um, it's been great to reconnect with friends we haven't seen since before the pandemic, um, you know, like before 2020. And it's been great to be a working, feel like a real working musician again on tour, earning a living, playing our songs and making those, you know, connections in, in that like face-to-face in-person way. Um, there's a lot I really missed about it. And, and then also being kind of out of that game for a while, I, I will admit I felt, um, as, as, as in, as much as I take care of myself, um, I felt like it was hard on my head and my body. And, uh, I don't know, you know, what everyone thinks touring is like. Um, I think it sounds glamorous and exciting, and certainly there are parts of it. There are moments where, you know, it it feels like I said before, rewarding, and you get to see places and and um, be in places and, and meet people and do things that you just don't normally get to do because. You know, a lot of the time, even I'm sitting at home in front of my computer screen working on the next thing, um, and uh, that takes a lot of time. There's a big part of choosing to at least do what I do um, involves a lot of, like, accepting that it's not all, it's just not all fun. There's going to be painful moments, and it's going to be hard on my head, and that I have a lot to work on, you know? But I never do it alone. I mean, I have always people around me. Um, I've been, uh, you know, actually consciously deciding to um, choose to touch base and, and, you know, have mentors along the way. And I've actually been this entire, the entire tour, and I started this summer. I, um, I don't know if I've mentioned this on the podcast at the end of season two or not, probably not. Um, but I started taking, uh, vocal lessons and I've, this is the first time I've really done this, uh, steadily, uh, with an incredible, uh, musician and producer and creator and human, uh, named M Griner. 
I, I, I was reading her book. I hope, you know what, I haven't even asked her formally yet, so I don't want to jinx it, but I, I do want to ask if she'll be a guest on the podcast. Um, I'm hoping she'll say yes. And uh, um, yeah, no pressure, Em. But um, the other thing I I uh, was able to do with Em throughout the tour, which really helped me, um, was work with M. She's been career coaching basically, yeah, throughout that in three months that I was on tour. And I really found that helpful to have that support. Um, because, you know, during the tour, uh, it's, it's like you're, you want to be <laughs> present and, and in the moment, which is the most enjoyable thing to be, but I do find myself having to plan ahead and think about the future. And that can be, I, I get, you know, quite, um, stressed out about all that. I guess this all is on the topic of like learning how to ask for help, uh, ongoing, you know, you'd think, oh, you get to a certain age or a point in your career, your life, your business that you don't need help anymore. And then it's just bullshit. <laughs> so shout out to M Griner. I look forward to, uh, well, geez, I just signed up for taking piano lessons. Um, so there's that, but I hope we get to work together in, uh, more in the future. And uh, you've been a great inspiration and support. All that to say, folks, I'm back home and it feels a fucking amazing to be home. I love, I love our home. I love what Dale and I have, um, have worked hard, continue to work hard to kind of build and maintain. And I just love coming home to a, a routine and a, a quiet place. And uh, we've done a few hikes in the woods. It's been lovely and reconnecting with friends and family has been great. And the holiday seasons are coming up and I thought it would take me longer, but I couldn't wait. I was really looking forward to starting this podcast up again. So here I am. And, uh, I want to, I want to talk about my, my guest for season three, episode one. Okay. So this is an old friend of mine and I just love him dearly. He's, he's a talented, uh, well, he's a talented many things. Um, I'm going to go through, I'm just going to go through like a bullet, bullet list here, um, that I pulled from his bio, Andrew Sisk, a dear old friend of mine uh, from New Brunswick, as I am as well. We both grew up in the province of New Brunswick. That's uh, in the Atlantic Canada for our overseas um, out of Canada <laughs> listeners. Um, Andrew has written and performed in several touring bands in Canada. I'm going to name some here. Cher, Sleepless Nights, Jen Grant, Coco Echo. Uh, he independently has released 14 albums, some of which you can find on his band camp. I want to, I want to share a story because I covered one of Andrew's songs. It's called Subject to Change. Um, it's on my 2010 album, I Can Too. And Blue Rodeo's Greg Keeler came into the studio when we were recording and he sang on that track with me and uh, he played baritone guitar. And that was a really fun ex uh, experience in the studio uh, for me. Um, I had uh, been chatting with Dale about how great it would be if Greg would would perform on this song of Andrew's. And Dale and I were invited to um, a private acoustic show with um, Greg Keeler and Jim Cuddy at a venue called The Carlton in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And so we were backstage with uh, Greg um, after the show. And Greg was asking me, he's such a nice guy. Um, he Dale, Dale's toured with Blue Rodeo, opening up uh, with Cuff the Duke in, in that band and and uh, was friends with Greg. And so that's how I was introduced to Greg. And he was just really just super down to earth and nice very kind to me and easy to talk to. And so we were backstage chatting and Greg uh, was asking me, you know, what's up, what's going on? And I said, well, I'm, I'm actually recording um, an album right right now with Dale at his home studio in Dartmouth. And then Greg immediately, I didn't even have to ask. He just said, I'd love to play on it. Yeah, I want to play on it. And I was very quick <laughs> to say, well, actually there's a song that we have in mind that you'd be perfect for. And, uh, I went on to tell him a little bit about the song. He was like, yeah, sure. 
when do you want me in? And so he literally came in the next day and just banged out the part. So check out the song, Subject to Change. Um, yeah, that's an Andrew Sisk song. So thanks, Andrew. Um, Andrew's now scoring music for film and, and he loves it. He has a new album out. It's his most ambitious work as a composer, songwriter, and arranger. It's called Adrift, and I got to sing on it, which I, I love singing on Andrew's songs. Andrew describes this, uh, this album as um, a poetic musical experience through the journey of healing from trauma. Hey, this is right up my alley. I hope you enjoy my chat with heart with my dear friend, Andrew Sisk. All right, I'll use my radio voice. Yeah, I love it. Um, Andrew, I'm so excited that you're here. Welcome to, oh my God, welcome to A Chat With Heart. I, mean, I, I thought I wasn't going to start this up again for like maybe a year. And then as soon as I got home and I thought of you and I was like, no, I, I really, I want to chat with heart with Andrew. I'm delighted. I'm so uh, grateful. I, I miss you. I haven't spoken to you in, in too long. I miss you too, buddy. There's a buffalo right behind you on the wall. Yeah, yeah. Where's that from? Like a used clothing store. That's you know, like a like a they call it a friperie here. It's like you know, a Salvation Army kind of place. Yeah, you went to get clothes, and you got. I a- went. I went. That's right. I went in to get see if I could get a collared shirt or something, mm. and uh, I saw it, and I was like, "That speaks to me." So I got it. And why does it speak to you? Well. Uh, years ago, I did a project called The Passing of the Buffalo by Buckskin, which was based on this book that had been published in 1916. And um, I found it when I was on tour playing in bands. And uh, it was like an old play that had been published. And when I researched it, there was like nothing. There was nothing to be found about it. And uh, the more I dug, the more curious I got. And it was really beautiful is the thing. It's like, it's a play about how uh, the North American buffalo became extinct. Um, and it was written in 19 or published in 1916. And, uh, so it was, um, I'm going to sneeze. I'm so sorry. No, you can now. Like there's, we don't, we don't care about COVID. <laughs> so uh, go ahead. People won't stop listening because you start sneezing. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the passing of the Buffalo by Buckskin was this book I'd found and, um, I just decided to do something with it, you know, and I applied for funding, but I didn't get any funding. So I just kind of like made something that I could make on my own, which was like, I got together with my friend Pete Hall, who plays guitar and lap steel. And, um, we kind of like, I crafted these, uh, with a four track, an old cassette four track. I recorded myself reading excerpts from this play and then I wrote little parts and um and then Pete and I flushed them out and then we recorded it at the House of Miracles um studio and um live with interacting with the dialogue and it was a really cool experience and it's like this 10 minute long like sound art piece but um it's, not, it's something I'm really proud of and I ever since then whenever I see buffaloes like I have a little buffalo pin on my my denim jacket and I you know anytime I come across buffaloes I feel uh an affinity for them I love it I'm going to revisit it because you sent it to me. You sent that piece to me a long time ago and I listened and uh, I think I need to get back to it. But is there a place that, that people can check it out? Is it on your Bandcamp? Yeah, it's uh, it's on Bandcamp. It's on Spotify. It's oh, on, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, uh, it re- for some reason it got put, like people really resonated with it in like uh, the Scandinavian part of the world. And mm-hmm. so it was like on a lot of playlists up there for some reason. Do you want to include an address so that listeners can send you Buffalo paraphernalia um, whenever? Because <laughs> now that I know this, you know, I'm going to have my eye Uh-oh. out for, Uh-oh. I'm going to send you well, a maybe. hook. <laughs> That's creepy, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> yeah, is it? A hook would be creepy. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a minimalist, so no need, no need mm-hmm. for, for gifts. Uh, let's talk about our Grand Falls connection. Because I, I know our cross, our cross must have passed um, <laughs> back when I was living in Grand Falls, New Brunswick. That's one of the places I grew up, but I don't remember you. And 
So well, I, 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 yeah, I really didn't spend much time there. I really didn't. Uh, we would maybe visit briefly. Uh, we had family there. Um, but, you know, so I didn't know it that well until I think it was the summer I was 18. I, I worked for my uncle for a month there, washing cars and stuff. And, um, and uh, that's the only time I ever spent in, in Grand Falls. I'm pretty sure you weren't there because I was hanging yeah. out with your friends. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, because I was at Deep River Science Academy learning how to cleanse the groundwater from toxic waste to save yeah. lives. So you were cleaning cars. I was trying to clean the water that you were using on cleaning the cars. And yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, I remember some friends had some crushes on you. I remember them talking about you, but I don't, I think I may have met you very briefly. Um, I'm not going to name names. I saw the excitement in your face when I <laughs> mentioned the crushes. Um, well, well, I'm sure they all had crushes, but maybe I'll get them to call the heartbeat hotline and, uh, leave an anonymous message. Yeah or then you still wouldn't know, but you would at least get the proof that. Okay. And then you had a close uh, connection with uh, one of my best friends growing up, Molly Nugent. Mm -hmm. And um, that was from the Rotary Camp that you both worked at. Then you and I, I still think we met on a bus. Is that accurate? No, I don't think so. I think we met at uh, the Ecology Action Center fundraiser. Oh. That's what I think. Yeah. Uh, okay. And then that's why when I saw you on the bus, that's why I was like, here, here's a, a demo or a recording of my first album. And I'm right. doing the show. I think that's how it worked. But that you probably is, didn't yeah. remember me before. And you were like, <laughs> you were like, some guy gave me a CD. But right. And was it on the bus you asked if I wanted to participate in the show? I or? think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's when I, that that began my love for your music and you. Um, platonic. Lucky. L lucky me. Lucky me. Lucky me too. Um, I was so lucky. You know, it's, it's, it harkens back to, not harkens, what's that word even mean? Mm, um, is that a sound so, that a specific kind of bird makes? I think it is yeah. a hark, the herald angels yeah. Yeah, thing. Exactly. Or angels. Angels make that. Angels hark. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Well, either way, uh, it, it, it shows what a different time it was that um my plan was to get people to play my release show and i just walked around with a bag mm -hmm. of my of C burnt cds handing yeah. them running running into people because i knew i would run into everyone you know what i mean yeah but you ran into me worked. on a bus yeah i mean like that I, I can't remember last time i took a bus but uh i guess that might have been it actually yeah <laughs> I th do you think i think you could still i think you could still do stuff like that. I used to do stuff like that too. Just kind of like go out there and just the other day I was thinking like, I really want to get rid of a bunch of CDs that are just taking up space. And um, I feel like they're better off in people's hands. If it weren't for the fact that a lot of people no longer have a CD player, including yeah. myself. And then the thought came up, no, you know, I'm going to creep people out. If I just walk around like handing people or ring their doorbell and give them a free CD, like, that's going to be creepy, but back back then, I, I mean, I think it was exciting and fun, and we didn't care. But yeah, I think we could just do stuff like that still today, don't you? We should. Maybe I just think that people go out less. Uh, mm. It's just you know, like the idea that you live in a small enough community, and the music community in Halifax at that time in the early two thousands was small enough that you could be like, well, I know where that person's work it works, and I'll just go drop off where. <laughs> I'll go see them at their workplace. They work at the cafe and someone works yeah. at the art supply store and someone's a student at NASCAD art college. So I'll go in there and I'll find them painting, you know, and that's literally what it was like. It was an adventure. And now everybody works at home and nobody wants to be disturbed. And don't you dare call somebody like randomly. Yeah. You have to text before you call. You have to that's text. That's where we're at. I know. I don't, I'm trying to stop doing that. I'm trying just to like, with friends, with close friends, with, you know, yeah. business stuff, I'll maybe set up an appointment. But uh, I like the cold calls sometimes. Yeah, no, me too. I, I don't mind them. I'm just, it seems to be uh, the way now. Yeah. I don't, I don't ever expect anybody to answer. In fact, I expect them to listen to their voicemail, which I know a lot of people don't even do that. Mm -hmm. um, but... I, I, what I do kind of resent is the, 
idea that if you call somebody, I don't want people to feel they have to call me right back. Like, yeah, you know, it should be, I think the phone, I still believe the phone is there for the person who has the phone for their convenience. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I just don't, I don't think we should expect people to like, like with text messaging, even respond within, uh, eight hours, but that's just me. No, it's true. Some people will be like, why are you texting me? And you're like, you can answer whenever you want. <laughs> There's no rush. Yeah. I, I was wondering if you could, on. Um, I just want to go back to like, uh, we're friends, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. we're, we're definitely friends. And I know you have a lot of really good friends and there's a story that I would love for you to share. I'm just going to say two words. And then if you feel like sharing the story of this adventure, I don't know. Do you know what I'm about to say? No idea what you're about. No idea. I'd love for you to talk about it because it's just a great representation of close friendships. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ready? Big pink. Okay. Yeah. So, um, (laughs) I now just, he's so, you're smiling listeners can't see this yeah but you're smiling but your reaction was like so blasé <laughs> no not blasé <laughs> okay all right i'm just, I'm oh, just that, chill oh that old oh that old tale no i'm just chill that's yeah, all you are. i'm just a chill guy um i um well i have just like delightful incredible friends uh in large numbers and um i have this one a uh, little cluster of buddies uh, that is just two guys who uh, they both live in Nova Scotia now. But at one point we were spread out more. Um, we were all three in different places. But um, we met in Halifax when I was like playing in bands uh, a lot. And um, and I was playing. You were also playing in that band with us. Uh, oh, yeah. It was Prospector's Union, right. um, which was like, a, you know, like an old country band. And the, the songwriter singer was Matt Charlton. And, um, and I had met him when I was touring with another band and he had, he had uh, started a, a publicity company. And, um, and so I, he had helped me with like, uh, press releases and campaigns for the first few albums I made. And, um, me too. Me too. Yeah. He's so great. Yeah. He, he's just, he, you know, is. he, he still is. He's, right. <laughs> yeah. He still is. Yeah. He's just like an incredible person. And, uh, and I was just couldn't believe that he wanted to be my friend, you know. Oh, uh, that's so sweet. Because he... he's a cool, he's a cool, amazing dude. And uh, that's and sweet. then and that's true. And then he was good friends with Jason McIsaac, and lots of my friends uh, were friends with Jason McIsaac, who is a composer, uh, songwriter, had been in a band called the Heavy Blinkers that were like you know extremely uh, lauded and praised and um, and accomplished. And uh, I, I didn't really know Jason very well. Um, and so, but they were saying how they were starting to jog in the morning around the commons. And I had just moved in to an apartment really close to there. And uh, and I was like, oh yeah, I used to jog all the time. Anyway, so we started jogging at like 7 a.m. Oh, together. Oh, jog together, that's so it great. Didn't, and it didn't last long, but we did it for a while. And then we just started going out for breakfast and lunch together all the time. Mm-hmm. And we just became fast friends. And it was just so much fun because I uh, I was learning so much from them. I was learning so much about music and the music industry and about all sorts of stuff I had no idea about. And they just became incredible f- close friends uh, with a shared sense of humor and interests and stuff. And uh, so for like years, maybe decades at this point, we've had like a text chain that we've maintained. We text all of the time. <laughs> like I don't feel a need for social media because I have this text chain where, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. where uh, uh, I get all the feedback or giggles I want. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so it, uh, we became this really close friend group and one year, maybe six years ago or so, um, one of the shared interests and loves is the band of, you know, Rick Danko and Robbie Robertson, Garth Hudson, Lee Von Helm, and uh, who did I miss? Uh, Richard Manuel. And so um, they were Bob Dylan's backing band. Uh, you know, they're, you know, one of the most legendary classic rock bands and um, grew up loving them, obsessed. You know, I've read so many biographies about them and all that stuff. And we would often talk about them. And um, it was one spring where Matt uh, reached out to us about going to a friend's cottage in New York State, is what he said. And so I thought I was going to meet them, out of because I live in Montreal. I thought I was going to meet them, and we were going to go to his friend's cottage. 
And I am pretty sure in the preamble, like I was clueless. I was like, you know that where we're going is pretty close to Big Pink is what I remember saying. Oh, like, yeah. Maybe, maybe we can go see it, you mm -hmm. know. And um, Big Pink is the house that the band had lived in. Uh, and Bob Dylan lived nearby and they had made recordings in the basement. It's this legendary place. And, and unbeknownst to me, uh, it had been turned into like an Airbnb. And uh, Matt had secretly booked it. Jason, I think, knew what was going on at some point. I was clueless. And um, anyway, so we met up and uh, and we were in two different cars. I was in my car and they were in theirs. Uh, and I remember we just drove up and we were driving down this road. And I, I remember thinking like, oh, man, this looks like because I had seen a documentary about it. And um, I was like, it looks like we're in that zone. Like, imagine if I, we could go find Big Pink. Imagine that. Yeah. And um, and we pulled up to the house and I was just like, this looks exactly like Big Pink. <laughs> <laughs> but you weren't were you, did uh, Were you like, I was this is shock. it? You were, no, okay. I, I was in total shock. I, I rolled down my window because I didn't understand what was happening. Matt yeah. said we had to stop somewhere before we were going to the cottage. Okay. And then Matt started talking to the guy who came out of the house. And I was just like, what is happening right now? And I got out of the car and I was like, what's going on? And he was like, do you know where we are? And I was like, big pink. And I was in total shock. And I just spent like hours in shock. And then I was like telling – I was telling the owners like every nuanced detail of the history Amazing. that I'd ever learned. It was embarrassing, <laughs> but uh, I, I nerded out so hard and we stayed there for two days. And it was so much yeah. fun. I love to, like, it. Yeah. Have you guys gotten in any big fights since that experience? And no, would we... this, <laughs> would the big, would the big pink experience just override any fight that you might have with oh, uh, Jason I... and, and Matt? Ne I would never. I would do anything for them. They're uh, they're the best. They've oh, saved my cool. life so many times. They're so they're so uh, incredible. They're in both incredible men and uh, great people, great humans. And they are. Um, yeah, I love them so much. Yeah, I love them too. They've enriched my life and enriched my artistic experience and my human experience uh, enormously. I've grown so much because of both of them. Do you think they'll listen to this? I certainly hope so. <laughs> <laughs> if they're as good as friends as I say they are. <laughs> yeah. 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 I want to, I want to touch on, um, cause you're somebody who I, I've always, um, really admired because of, I know how, I know how much it takes to, uh, <clears throat> what goes into, you know, writing a song, recording it, releasing it, um, just, you know, kind of, managing that all. And, uh, I know for myself, I, I really, when I have other things going on in my life, like work or, you know, stress and all that, it's just, I find it really hard to, to do the, uh, the art. So <clears throat> you're somebody who's managed an enormous amount of responsibilities in your work, your family, you know, personal life, and, and you have committed you just committed to con you know continue making art on a regular basis and ha you have this um curiosity as you mentioned earlier um and you you listen to that and you kind of let it lead you and the work you do is it ha it really artistic merit comes to mind like whenever i i think of the work that you're doing what do you think it is that keeps you making art and I'm just curious about what you think keeps you going and what are some helpful tips? No, I think that that's part of um, the human condition for people who who feel the desire to create uh, or they just feel like there's something missing in their life. I think usually that thing that is missing is a creative element because I think that like for me, I grew up in a very small village and I didn't have anything in common with the people I was growing up with, I felt. And, um, like I didn't play hockey. I, I, I didn't do those things. Uh, and I was a, a kid who was lived in his imaginative world and, and I knew I liked creating things and I, I dreamt of being a painter, but whenever I painted, I found it so unfulfilling. Um, and I, you know, my skill wasn't where I wanted it to be. And, mm -hmm. um, and so when I was like 13, I started playing guitar and it was one of those things that, you know, and my dad 
uh, played guitar. And he, every Sunday he would like go upstairs and like play Gordon Lightfoot and Neil Young and Bob Dylan songs and that kind of thing. And, um, and he'd even written a couple of songs, you know, when he was younger. And, uh, and so that was kind of a template that was there for me. And um, I ended up taking some guitar lessons and I like quickly surpassed him in, in guitar ability. And he was shocked and I was shocked. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, that's the beauty of a young uh, plastic mind. You know, you can learn so quickly. And and also I had so much free time. I was like a, a preteen, mm -hmm. you know, essentially. Um, you have so much time. I, I would just go home from school and play, be in my room playing guitar for hours and hours. And, uh, and I just quickly started writing songs and I had been like, you know, secretly writing poetry before that. Um, and it just became really naturally, to be honest, like it was one of those things where I just knew that you could put words onto music and you could just like make up melodies. And mm -hmm. I just knew you could do that. And so I started doing it and, uh, I did it right away and there was, I was bad. It was not good, right. but, uh, but I loved it. Like the, the sense of catharsis that I felt after I wrote a song, I would feel like a natural endorphin high for 24 to 48 hours. I was like high on life. Yeah. And I, I felt like I had, uh, a sense of accomplishment that I don't really feel when I do anything else. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that has just stayed with me um, as, because it, you really are creating something from nothing. And that is a, and when you're in that space, f that flow state that people talk about, you do feel like you're communing with something like out of body, you, something uh, deeper than the mundane world. Yeah, you know how I know that too is because sometimes I, I'll, I'll, if I'm listening to a song that I've written or recorded, and I'm just my thought in, in the moment is, how the fuck did I do that? Like, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't have written that today. I'm not in the yeah. zone, of course, but that's why I, I feel I agree with that. That it's, yeah, yeah um, it's yeah. like a unworldly experience. At times, not always, but at times yeah. it, it is. Sometimes it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes it's like accounting, you know, mm -hmm. um, or editing. You're like editing an essay or something. Yeah. I was writing songs for maybe 10 years before I started showing anyone. Oh, wow. And, um, and then, and I was definitely, it was definitely like maybe 12 or 14 years before I dared record something. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, because I valued music so highly. And I had so much respect for recording artists and recordings. Like I'm still like, live music is an amazing experience. But for me, I love the art form of recorded music. I just love what yeah. you can do with recorded music. Um, and I love cherishing specific recordings. Um, and I, that's just, it took me a long time to realize like that is an art form. Yeah. And that you can pursue it as an art form and perceive it as an art form. And that it's not just like I'm trying to make, like long ago, I let go of any kind of um, desire to like make something that has any kind of like um, designed outcome. And it is mm -hmm. very much an internal journey of exploring words and sounds that uh, achieve what I, th that resonates with me. Because it ends up being this mirror for your own conscious experience. And uh, I don't know if you've ever had that experience, especially with writing lyrics, where you've written a song um, and maybe you've like improvised over the chords with a melody and you've improvised words and then you go back and you find some keywords and then you like reverse engineer a song. I do that a lot. Mm -hmm. And when I do, I often find that what ends up coming out is something I didn't know I was feeling that had been like a suppressed thought or emotion. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. um, and so it becomes this weird, like essential process in my life. And that was like in my twenties that I realized that. And, you know, when I became a father and I was, uh, I had been playing in bands and I just knew that it wasn't sustainable for me to like live the lifestyle that I think the industry expected of me. And I knew I was unhappy as a touring musician. I was unhappy as uh, running, you know, an entrepreneurial band venture. Mm -hmm. um, I knew it wasn't what I wanted to do. I knew I had other skills and talents and, um, but I still wanted to keep this sacred act of songwriting in my life. And I just realized that like, um, I could still do that. 
and I can do other things for money and make a living and, and have a lifestyle that I feel is healthier for me uh, mentally and spiritually and emotionally and physically. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. um, and that was me. And, and I know that I have limitations that other people don't. And, um, and so I just, once I committed to that, because at first I thought I'm just going to quit, I'm just going to yeah. quit music and I'll start writing novels, you know, and I started trying to write and, uh, it's so unfulfilling <laughs> for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. the, that I love, I love that. I love all you, all you just said. Um, so but you had, sorry, you had asked like advice for other people. And I just yeah. think that like the, the things that we hear, the cliches that we hear about like not giving up uh -huh. and, and, and like staying curious yeah. and, um, like you know, and like the idea of like, uh, having a space and a place in your, in your home or, or studio, whatever it is, but having that space cr set up so that you can sit down and create when you, when you do have the time or energy, mm -hmm. like the, all of that stuff is essential. Like it, there's, it's an, it's not a simple answer. It's a, it's a complicated path, but, um, mm -hmm. and I think that like anything can be that it can be cooking. It can be gardening. It could be anything knitting. knitting only those three things, those three things. Just, okay. <laughs> all right. So fine. Basically, I mean, yeah, I think we're all each different. Like there are things about your, what you've talked about that resonate a hundred percent. Well, most of it does resonates with me. Um, and I know routine is important, but my routine changes constantly, but there is always, at least in my mind, I got to have a routine, even though, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the exercise happens at the end of the day for six months. And then I switch it to the beginning of the day because it's no longer working for me or, mm -hmm. um, but I, I love what you said about just um, when you make a space, when you dedicate, like carve out a space in where you live or a place that you go to during the day. I remember when I was younger, living in Austin, Texas, and I worked at a middle school and they had rehearsal rooms for the music department. And so for my hour lunch break, I would go and have my lunch alone and then practice my songs in just in a tiny room by myself um, and that became my routine at that time, you know, and, uh, or I would just write in that hour in solitude kind of thing. Um, but just people, I think one of the, one of the things that commonly I've said to myself, and I know other people say is I don't have time. People want to, they say, I don't have time. And I know that you just have to make the time. Like you just, you yeah, can, no, that's true. You know, you're, I think sometimes I, I like that cliche, you know, you want something done, you give it to a busy person. Mm -hmm. I think some, you know, um, there's always somebody busier than me that's, that's somehow able to manifest far more, um, you know, than I, than I, and, and at certain times of my life. And I, and then I think, well, okay, I, I just need to be honest. Like, what's the real truth of my day? Am I, am I scrolling on social media for an hour spread out across the day well what could i do with that hour instead and then work towards changing those habits you know um but uh i think that's very true i think that like we in the modern world we have so many temptations and habits that we just think that like are um normal or or, or you know that we are expected of us or mm -hmm. and that we need them and i just know that like when I was in my twenties and I was writing all the time, I just didn't watch TV. Like I hardly yeah. ever watched anything. And, um, same, you know, and TV is a real, it's a real like life suck. You know what I mean? It really like it's, is. Yeah. Um, I'm working and, on that now, actually stopping yeah. streaming shows that like making it a treat again to watch a movie on yeah. a Friday night. Like I love shows, mm -hmm. but for years after reading the the book flow, when I was a, a teenager, I remember dead, like being like, I'm not watching television. I'll watch movies occasionally, or if I'm babysitting at night, I'll watch, uh, you know, reruns of Oprah and Ellen DeGeneres or something fun. But, um, but yeah, it uh, and that really gave me so much more time than a lot of people had to do yeah. things outside of my day jobs. You know, yeah, I think um, creative work is always creative work is always time spent with yourself, and if you're always distracted by other things, then uh, you have to like re reintroduce yourself to yourself, like reacquaint yourself with what's going on. And it's in that space that you can create and, and you can create without being in that space. But when you do create in that space, you feel the benefit of it. 
Mm -hmm. There's an energy that you're transitioning into this art form, whether it be cooking or whatever. Yeah. And, um, and I think that, uh, that's, I think the modern condition is like our smartphones, which are so sinisterly designed to, uh, to rape us of our life. (laughs) Well, no, just to like (laughs) harsh, (laughs) but, but they are, they are designed to hijack our natural, like bio, uh, rhythms and and mm-hmm. and our hormonal cycles and the dopamine and all of the things that that kind of drive our behavior it kind of hijacks that and it makes it so addictive and I, everyone struggles with that I struggle with that everyone I think yeah, is struggling I with that and um and you you have to like intentionally take time away and turn it off and um and make space and time for it and I think that anyone who wants to be more creative they have to realize like it's a momentum thing where you have to to push that boulder at the very start. You have to like make yourself sit down with the journal and the pen in your hand mm-hmm. or at the typewriter or whatever it is you want to do. You have to like force yourself to do that first step yeah. because with momentum is everything in life, I feel like. Yeah. I want to go back to you said uh, that your dad had written some songs. Do, mm-hmm. do you have a recording or written material from, from that? And have you ever done anything with it or thought of, I say this cause my dad, um, I think my dad would have liked to have, you know, been an artist. Um, and he had written some poems when he was younger. I have, I, I have them typed up. Um, and the other thing I have of his, is um, cassette tape recordings of his voice, uh, that he used to mail me when, when I was a teenager, that's how we corresponded. And I was, oh, not, I've, I've thought sometimes it might be interesting to spend some time with those and, you know, just see what comes up, but what about you for your dad and his letter or his songs? Yeah, we have a lot of um, recordings. And, you know, when he was dying um, of cancer, he, uh, I went back and, uh, and we recorded two new songs he had written. He had written this political song, you know, oh, yeah? against Trump, you know. No way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was just, you know, he was so pure uh, in that way. He was like a child in some ways. He was so innocent and uh, idealistic. Aww. And um, yeah, he was a good man. And, um, but yeah, I haven't done anything with them. Um, you know, I, I, I think that day, that day will come, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah. I, I think you have, uh, I, I don't think of you as a child, but I think you, I think you still maintain that child, childlike curiosity and energy. I mean, whenever I'm around you, like, I feel like I can, be myself in that way and, and just be free. Like in the way you move your body um, and aren't afraid to dance around and be a goofball. Cause you know, I, I love being around people like that because I think I wish I could be that way more often. And I, and oftentimes I, maybe I still stifle myself or something around people, but I love that about you. And maybe that's something that you inherited from your dad. I don't know. Or maybe it's just your yeah. own. Yeah, yeah. My dad was so serious and formal. Oh, really? Um, yeah. So most of the time, but when he would get silly, he would get really goofy and silly. Mm-hmm. And he and he loved entertaining children. Like he thought it was so. Like he loved making kids laugh. And I definitely inherited all those qualities. Yeah. What What do you think you in, do? You think you inherited anything from your mom? Oh yeah. I, I, well, mean, I obviously looked, you did, but <laughs> <laughs> your mom has a great beard. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but um, yeah, like I just uh, I was just visiting her this past summer, and a photographer friend was with me, uh, Scott. Scott, Mike, oh yeah, yeah. Who, a direct, film director, uh, documentary documentarian, film director, and photographer Scott Munn. Yeah. Anyway, he he just at, impromptu. At, I was standing beside my mom. He said, "Let me get a picture of you guys." And he took a couple pictures, and uh, I should send them to you. But yeah, it's please do. it's uh, you know, I, growing up, I people always told me I looked like my mom, yeah. but like in these two pictures we're smiling the same even though we, no one told us this, how to smile really? oh our heads God. are tilted and we're both smiling the exact same um, way that's that's adorable do you make the same freezer jam as your mom oh i wish no not yet i've never tried that i need to try that your mom's got some 
great freezer jam. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, and my, it was crazy. It was my dad's mom taught her how to make that, and uh, oh, that's so it's, great. Aww. Yeah, it's it is amazing. That's the nectar of the gods. That stuff. Yeah, yeah. I don't eat a lot of jam, but I devoured your mama's jam. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. the, what we're going to call this episode, Your, your Mama's Jam. <laughs> I have a number of books that I've noticed over, I'd say, the last 20 years or so. I've always had, and I, you know, I've maybe gifted some to people, and they're just always in my bookshelf. I go back to them, I reread them. It's as if sometimes I've, my brain has completely wiped them out and it's starting fresh, and mm -hmm. I haven't learned anything. Is there a book? Um, that's that's uh always sort of been in your in your toolkit i guess that you keep going back to it can be recent but maybe there's an older one like the bible just <laughs> well in all seriousness uh when i was in you know 17 i started mm -hmm. university and way too young yeah to like comprehend a lot of what you're learning at that time but uh, we read Herman Hesse's Siddhartha. Okay. And, wow. Um, and I had read, I read it at the time and I remember uh, being impacted by it in one way. And then uh, maybe like four or five years later, I traveled on an exchange program to Sri Lanka and I, I brought a copy with me and I read it again and I got totally different, you know, uh, inspiration and insight at that then. Mm -hmm. And then some point, um, after I think probably in my late twenties or early thirties, I read it again, and it was the same experience of being like, "Whoa, this book is." To I perceive everything that's happening totally differently, mm -hmm. and and um, for some reason, it it stays with me. I I've been working on for over ten years this idea that it's it's essentially like not a musical. It's not a musical, but it's a uh, like an album. But uh, the idea is that it would contain dialogue. Um, it's a musical. But Isn't it's it? a musical. It's a musical. It's such a scope there. It. And people love, most There's... people love musicals. Yes, they're made fun of. But I think underneath, most people, <laughs> you're good. It's not a musical. I mean, it's on a stage. There is dance choreography. I think it's but... a musical. It's just, uh, a big a chorus. Boxes. Okay. A lot of costumes. All right. <laughs> is there glitter? Is there no. Glitter? <laughs> but I have been like trying, I have this, this idea that, and I don't know about you, but like, I'll just get ideas that nag at me that they won't go away. And this has been mm -hmm. one and I've written, there's like five or six songs I've written for this thing. And I've just, it's the other parts of it that just seem so daunting that when I, I, I have like, you know, outlines and like sure. ideas written down and I'm, I'm constantly changing and working how the narrative will work. And, yeah. but it's been going on forever and it's kind of, um, and now that I think about it, it's about, it's inspired by the, the life of the Buddha. Okay. Um, but, um, but I, so that book Siddhartha, I think has, it's something that like, it's still on my bookshelf and. Yeah. Um, uh, you keep going back to it. And, yeah. It's, it's yeah. the one thing that is like, of all of the books I've read, it's the now, one that keeps going back. Okay. Thank you for answering my question. And. Um, my next question is, is there a small role for me uh, in this musical? And yeah. I don't mean behind the scenes. I mean, I yeah. want to be... One of the main characters? I don't know, like delivering a loaf of bread to somebody yeah. or... Um, yeah, definitely, yeah. I mean, are there female characters? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, yes. We it's not Lord of the hair. Rings. It's not Lord of the Rings <laughs> okay, where there's okay. no female characters. Um, uh, no, yeah, no. Uh, I I am toying with the idea of like making it like an art, sound art series of some kind that contains songs within it, but it is uh, like a narrative podcast kind of thing, mm -hmm. audio book. I don't know. So yes, I will. Okay. I'll need you to work for free. Yeah, that's fine. Like sign me up. Um... I mean, you know, if there's a role that you feel I can nail, of course. Okay, great. Before I let you go, I want to talk about uh, the work you're focused on right now. Um, because you you put out a new album in 2023. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's called Adrift. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful. And of course, we'll point people to your 
Bandcamp and your website so they can check it out more. And by the way, I want to mention the two recent videos, um, Adrift. There's a video that Jen Grant did. I saw it. It's beautiful. And then there's a recent one for Day by Day that Scott Munn uh, directed. Great. Yeah, he like well he 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 filmed it all and then I just chopped it together. Nice. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. And where was that? It's on the beach somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, it's outside of Shediac. Um it was that was literally we went for a walk on the beach and he was like, "Hey, I thought he was taking photos." Literally and he was like oh. filming and uh <laughs> and he was like, "I got a bunch he was like, "I got a bunch of uh great shots." And I was like, that's "Okay. Best. That's awesome." Yeah, it was and it, it really was a beautiful day. It was in uh just outside of Shediac or in Shediac, I guess, and um, New Brunswick. And uh, cause he had directed a, a documentary called uh, Freeman Patterson, the universe is unfolding. And he had asked me to score that. Yes. And that was like a, that was like a three year long process. Um, and so wow. it, it was being released and um, we were, he had asked me to perform at the, at the screenings in St. John and Fredericton. And mm -hmm. uh, they were in really beautiful places like the, the uh the theaters that we were in and the art gallery that we performed in was um was really beautiful and so i just played like two songs and then they played the film and um Perfect. and so i was back for that and uh and that's why uh and i played songs from adrift because yeah. obviously it came the drift came out the same day as that documentary which was not by design it was literally happened by accident uh, you know, I, I've i always written albums where I have a few songs and then I'm like, oh, these songs go together thematically somehow, lyrically. And um, and then I flush out, I start writing to expand on that idea. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much every album I've ever made. And um, there's only a few, there's only like one exception where I didn't do that. And, uh, and this was one where um, I wanted to try something, you know, I was just... I was kind of bored with what I was writing mm -hmm. and I, I wanted to do something different and more challenging. And I had written this song called Adrift that very much captured um, what it was like to go through something very, very difficult. Like one of, you know, like when you go through a life tragedy mm -hmm. and, and, uh, or tragedies clustered mm -hmm. together and you're in a low point and then it is that rising up experience from the lowest point of your life that, um, I wanted to try to capture and and I wanted to try to capture some of the like the honest uh spiritual growth or the outcomes um that I could share with people that would yeah. like ideally uh inspire someone who felt lost or hopeless or alone. Mm -hmm. And uh I really felt a strong desire to help people who had been through what I was going through. And, um, and when I, I literally was like researching, how do I become a therapist or how do I become a count, you know, and, and everything was like a, a two or three year master's program. And, um, and I was like, how can I help people with what I already know how to do and can do? And I've, I've always written songs. And I just thought like, what if, what if I could write songs that if someone heard them and they felt that way, that there would be like a line in the song that would stick yeah. out to them. And it would give them hope or a sense of light or a sense of promise for the uh, a better future. And um, and so I had never done something that and, I, and to me that like that feels all awfully vulnerable. And I was mm -hmm. very scared, mm -hmm. very scared to write in that vein, honestly and vulnerably. Uh, and so I was terrified to do it. And that's how I I knew I had to do it as soon as I realized I was scared. And so I did. And so the challenge I decided to do is that I had written a, a drift, which is like, uh, there's a lot of like major minor sevenths chords and like these kind of, and I, and it's, it's a song that's like full of different parts. And I thought to myself, I'm going to deconstruct that one song and tell different aspects of the story. So I would like take an element of the chord progression and reuse it in a different way for a different song, take yeah. an element of a melody and use that melody to build a new chord progression, you know? And like I was doing that with every song in the album is connected musically and lyrically and in a way I had never tried to do. And so it very much is like a, a song cycle of uh, intertwined interwoven narratives that kind of drag someone through the process of uh, realizing where they are in a bad state, uh, revisiting the trauma and then 
the process of going through the disorientation and the sense of um, hopelessness and and then how light comes in and how you rise up and how you have to deal with shame and you have to deal with all of those things. And so this was my best attempt. Um, and thanks to the Canada Council for the Arts, um, I applied for a research and design. Um, and so that allowed me to um, like, not just like research uh, trauma and PTSD, but also to research like arranging, uh, cause I wanted to elevate I wanted the music to be very powerful musically. Mm -hmm. um, and so I mentored with Dave Christensen, who is uh, the writer arranger for Symphony of Scotia and who I, had been a former bandmate of mine many years ago when I played in Jen Grant's band. And, um, and we always got along and uh, he agreed to mentor me. And so we would just have like sessions and I would show him my work and he would give me feedback. And it was really like, I felt so much growth musically that I had not felt since the early days of like learning music and um and that's really like it, it, i feel elevated musically in ways that i had i hadn't experienced before and uh and so that album was actually supposed to be demos but in the end um it was like good enough that mike fierstack who is a good friend of mine here he mixed it and now we were like this is the album this i guess this is, is yeah <laughs> yeah if you're even just curious don't really understand you know, what you're going through. I mean, maybe there's something in a drift that um, you might, might resonate and you can go from there, you know? Well, that was my hope at least. And I, and I know that, um, I know that uh, I wanted to lyrically write from a point of view of um, being on the other side of it. Uh, that because people, when they're in it, it's, it's hard to see sometimes that things will get better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I wanted to always have that in every song, an element of there, by the end of the song, there's a resolution of like, yeah. And ideally some, some kind of mantra of, uh, that you can hold on to, to, uh, navigate, you know, and when you're when you're in your twenties and you're, and you're making art or you're in a band or whatever it is, and, um, or you're just in your twenties, <laughs> yeah. you don't necessarily, yeah. you know, it's, there's, there's, um, you know, lots of unlucky people who have, you know, all sorts of traumas that they experience at that age. But, um, a lot of people, I know that I, I should speak for myself. I know that I didn't consider all of, um, the, yeah, the normal, like you, no one escapes the loss of loved ones or a separation of some kind yeah. or uh, the loss of material wealth or possessions or opportunities, um, failure of some kind, um, you know, illness uh, to you or someone you love, like uh, those things happen to you, you. You can't get through life without running into those things. And, um, and that's, you know, that poem Desert Dorada, it has that line that says, foster strength of spirit uh, so that when you, you know, I can't remember the exact line, but so that when you encounter hardship, uh, that you're prepared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't remember that in there, but I'm just kidding. I think, <laughs> I think it's in there. Maybe I'm thinking no, of a Van Halen song. I, I think you are. Uh, no, I, I my my brother sent me that poem, and I remember having it taped in one of my journals years and yeah. years ago. I I don't remember, but I uh, I don't remember what it says. But no, it very may well be. I I trust your memory uh, far above my own. Um. Okay. So um, maybe nothing's next for you. But what's next for you? <laughs> what's well, I've been composing music for film is uh, something I'm really interested in uh, right now. It was a really yeah. good experience. Um, it's a totally different challenge and it's the same kind of, it's like using the same muscles and skills to do something completely different. And um, that's, it's fun. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that's something that's coming up and. Um, is it easier for, for you is it easier sometimes? Cause sometimes Dale and I will uh, write music for um, film and TV and we don't, they don't want lyrics. And sometimes I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, I agree. 
uh, lyrics are absolutely, if you're going to write authentic, like lyrics that you have to sing yourself, that is the most, that is one of the most demanding things to ask a person to do. Um, especially after so much has been written, you know, we're in this mm -hmm. era to, to have a lyrical voice that is your own. That's a real challenge. And I think that, um, uh, yeah, just writing music is so, so much easier and so much more playful and fun. And I think that's the, when I teach a songwriting workshop at Shivering Songs Festival. Um, I've done it for the last three or four years. Um, that's one of the things I always say is that, you know, when people want to write something musically, they'll be fun and experimental when it comes to the musical part. But when it comes yeah. to the lyrical part, they they never apply it with the same approach or idea it's not it's very rarely playful and it's very rarely experimental mm -hmm. um and I, I think that's why people get stuck um lyrically oh that's that, a good point yeah i yeah. should actually i'm going to take that as an advice for whatever the fuck i'm going to do i love you andrew i think you're a wonderful friend and human and a gem and uh, thank you for taking my calls sometimes <laughs> and uh, your wisdom and sharing so much of yourself, you know, in our friendship. And I know, you know, you're like that in life with, I think the people that you care about. Um, but I just really appreciate you. And uh, I hope you know that you've had a big in impact on my life. Thank you so much. Uh, you, you as well, you have yes. been such an incredible friend and have been such a wonderful Go on. <laughs> Is this the part of the podcast? We're going to cut this out the, the part that I that I just said and <laughs> go right to yes, yes, no. Uh, no, I, no. I, 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 cher I cherish our friendship and we've had so many amazing uh, times together. And I just think that um, I'm really grateful uh, to have our conversations. You're, you know, not everyone's interested in talking about the things that we talk about. And so it's a joy to have someone like that in our lives, you know, we, um, we as a community, uh, we're lucky. We're, we're so lucky. Yeah. We have so many good people in our, in our lives. Uh, I am so grateful. Um, and that's what, you know, that's one of the reasons I, when I make music, I try to involve my friends because we don't get to see our friends a lot and we don't mm -hmm. get to interact a lot. And it's like, for it motivates us to interact in a, in a beautiful way. And I feel like it, it, it leaves a trail uh, for the older versions of ourselves to look back and say, like, look, look at how our lives are intertwined creatively. And because mm -hmm. we knew socially, but, but it, to see it uh, and hear it, it's, I think it's magical. I do too. Did you enjoy your chat with Hart? <laughs> Is it, this better not be how the, the podcast starts. <laughs> the heartbeat hotline 1902-669-4769 i'm the host of a chat with heart podcast christina martin and i'm so excited you called leave me your question a suggestion for the podcast or a comment about this episode please be aware your message may be used on the podcast and social media tell me your name where you're calling from and it's also fine if you want to remain anonymous thanks for listening have a great fucking day Thanks for listening to A Chat With Heart podcast, produced by me, Christina Martin. Co-produced and engineered by my husband, Dale Murray. Dale's a stellar singer-songwriter and music producer, so check out his website, dalemurray.ca. The podcast theme song, Talk About It, and I Don't Want to Say Goodbye to You, were written by me and recorded by Dale. Visit my band camp to find uh, CDs, vinyl, digital music, and fun merch like custom-made puzzles and temporary tattoo packs become a monthly or yearly supporter of this podcast and my music endeavors on Patreon. If you're new to Patreon, it's a membership platform that helps creators get paid. I love it. Sign up as a free or paid member at patreon.com backslash Christina Martin. 
I would love it if you had time to share, rate, leave a review, and subscribe to A Chat With Heart on all the places you listen to podcasts. Wishing you, my little heartbeat listeners, a great day. Thank you.